hurts the most. Deeply traumatized, Dwayne was calm enough to establish that Stephen had been attacked by five or six white youths. Within the next 12 hours, it was clear that the local community had a good idea of who these young men might be. The police received a number of strong tip-offs. There was a witness giving the pseudonym James Grant, an anonymous female caller, and two handwritten notes, all pointed to Dobson, Norris and their gang. <laughs> Five boys, five names, constantly came up in the police investigation. Almost everybody in the communities knew about them, the schools knew about them. Everybody knew about them except the police. Norris and Dobson were also known under another name. Nutters with knives was used frequently. The two at the core of the group are the Acourt brothers, Neil and Jamie. And they are, they live right in the, in, the, in the middle of the area. The Acorts were known to have had a fascination with the Cray twins and reportedly styled themselves as the Eltham Crays. David Norris was one of their associates. He'd been linked to a number of incidents in the previous 12 months. One of them was the stabbing of white teenager Stacy Benfield. He was charged but later acquitted. There were plenty of other reasons why David Norris should have been on the police's radar, not least because of who his father was. It turned out that his father, Clifford Norris, uh, was in his own right quite a notorious criminal. His father was a, uh, a known and very serious uh, drug importer uh, and a violent criminal who was at that time on the run from the police. Gary Dobson lived in the heart of this neighborhood, in the Progress Estate, uh, just off Wellhall Road. A sort of unremarkable young man. Dobson seemed to us to be the, the one who was a little bit sort of out of it. He wasn't quite sort of, since he seemed to be so much of a hard nut as the others. And Luke Knight, who is another follower, another relatively quiet boy. In getting to this suspect group, which has been identified for them by dozens and dozens of people, they make extraordinarily slow progress. We were fobbed off to say that they had no idea about them and that is complete lies. After the first weekend, the investigation was due to be passed from Detective Superintendent Ian Crampton to another detective who had just returned from sick leave. Crampton had a big murder trial coming up which he would have to attend. What he did was in fact to set up an investigation rather than to pursue an investigation. Four days had now passed since Stephen's murder and the police were no nearer to making an arrest. The arrival of Mr. Whedon on Monday morning meant the same style of policing continued, but there was another problem. They had a, a mixture of a computer-based system and a paper-based system, which in fact turned out to be no system at all. As messages piled up in people's in trays and information failed to get through, more crucial hours were lost. The confusion grows um, and uh, opportunities are certainly lost for that reason. The speed of response in seeking out witnesses and getting a grip on the problem was too slow. The police later claimed that the local community were reluctant to provide them with information, but the many tip-offs they received did not bear out this claim. It's a myth. There was a, a wall of silence. There wasn't a wall of silence. There was a massive amount of information flowed in over time. There was a, a witness, who, a young skinhead, walked into the uh, police station saying, I knew who it was, you know, and they didn't act on it at all. The witness clearly identified David Norris as a possible attacker and also named Neil and Jamie Acourt as members of this gang. This could have led to immediate arrests, but a decision was made to postpone until the police had more evidence. Having passed on the idea of making quick arrests, despite the fact that they had uh, strong, strong tip-offs, um, they set about gathering evidence about this group in a rather haphazard and muddled way. I suppose no better word for it, a farce. There was a, a photographer in a, a safe house looking at the Acourt's home. He immediately saw activity, people coming and going. Indeed, he saw Jamie leave the house and get into a car 
with a large bin bag, which may or may not contain contaminated clothes. But they had no means of communication, so they could not alert any police resource that would have been able to uh, intercept that bag and discover what its contents truly were. The surveillance operation did at least prove an association between Dobson and Norris, which Dobson was to deny vehemently under questioning. Unfortunately, the photographs of them together were not passed to those interviewing the suspects, and yet another opportunity to tie up the case was allowed to slip away. They show the appearance of conducting an investigation, but actually they're not making progress. It's, it's, it's remarkably static for those two weeks. Steve's been murdered, and no one's doing nothing about it, yet everybody knows the names of the suspects. If it had been a white boy, they would not stop until they get the killer. Neville Lawrence was particularly suspicious about what he perceived to be a low level of forensic evidence gathering. He, he wasn't hearing from the police that they were, you know, that they were making any progress on that front. To seize forensic exhibits and then scientifically examine them, it is always better to do that as soon after the offence as possible. But most of the evidence wasn't even collected until the police started searching the suspects' houses a full two weeks after Stephen had been murdered. So a suspicion grows within days for the Lawrences that the police are not really doing this properly. While all this was happening, Duane and the Lawrences had been assigned family liaison officers who were meant to be supporting them. But from the beginning, the relationship was an unhappy one. They went to the house on the Saturday, the Sunday. They started asking in front of all these people, they started asking questions about it. They said, you, my son's just been murdered, do you mind? It became increasingly clear uh, as events wore on uh, that there was something wrong, that there was something wrong with the, with the investigation, there was something wrong with the way that the family were being treated. There was this combination of incompetence, indifference, the interests of justice were being let down. The police had failed to make any real progress with their investigation. Worse still, many officers continued to doubt the attack was racially motivated. Police officers just refusing to accept that the word nigger was used in the attack. If you don't identify race and race hatred uh, as a motive when it is a motive then you perpetuate the racism i just thought to myself well somebody's been murdered you know they're going to go out and look for his killers but as the days pass then you realize that it's a completely different thing that steam was a black boy and the interest was not there. After two weeks, the Lawrence's patience has run out. And uh, through a series of connections, they meet Nelson Mandela. He is just a, you know, an utterly dominating uh, personality and totally respected. And they meet him, and he steps outside his hotel with them to speak to the cameras. I'm very used to this type of thing where life is regarded as cheap in South Africa. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a sense of disconcert that it should happen in a country like Britain. The push from Nelson Mandela was instrumental. So after a delay of two weeks, suddenly there's a very rushed process of arrest. And that in itself is not particularly good. Fourteen days after the murder of Stephen Lawrence, the eyes of the world were now fixed on the Metropolitan Police Force. Public pressure was calling for them to act. And on Friday, May the 7th, 1993, they mounted dawn raids on the suspects' homes. With four out of the five now in custody, the next step was to search their houses. 
This was the police's chance to make up for previous mistakes and gather crucial forensic evidence. But it would prove to be yet another opportunity squandered. David Norris was not at home when the police arrived to arrest and search his house. It being a, a rather large and imposing house, the police officers decided that the level of search was such that they would not be tearing up expensive carpets. And it was the same story when they turned up at the A Court house. One of the sergeants went into that house, actually, and had evidence given to him the previous night from a, a, a person in the public to say that they keep knives under their floorboards. They went into that house, did they lift the floorboards? No, they didn't lift the floorboards. The police did come away with clothing belonging to the five boys, along with several knives, but at that stage, none of this evidence would prove to be incriminating. They were now relying on one of the suspects slipping up and implicating themselves in interview. But back at the station, things weren't going to plan. Most of the suspects don't talk to the police at all. We all have that right. But their behavior looked like the behavior of people who were schooled and prepared in how to fend off police scrutiny without giving anything away. With little forensic evidence and disappointing results in the interview room, the police felt convictions slipping away from them. Their last hope was that the only witness to the murder, Duane, would be able to provide them with conclusive identification evidence. I remember looking through um, the mirrors and believing that they could see me. I wasn't in the right frame of mind to be identifying people. I was completely frightened, paranoid, um, beyond words. In the course of three ID parades, Duane did identify Luke Knight and Jamie Acourt, but he failed to pick out Neil Acourt, David Norris or Gary Dobson. This was a devastating blow to the police's case. It was a sense that I had to attend. I had to try my best um, to relive the events, to identify these people um, as best as I could. In June 1993, the Lawrences finally held a funeral for their son in Plumstead Methodist Church. By now, tensions in the community were threatening to boil over. We had this procession through the streets. You could feel the, the, the anger there with people, and one, as one a minister, one had to address the anger. It was a righteous anger. The way that Neville and Doreen carried themselves in their grief was to have a profound effect, calming the angry crowd and preventing a potentially explosive situation from escalating into full-scale civil unrest. They represented what our community's response needed to be strong, but it had also to be dignified. <laughs> it's Doreen and it's Neville who deserve the praise and the love and the recognition. And I, I still think that neither of them get enough of it. Neville and Doreen then flew to Jamaica to bury their son. While they were abroad, they received some devastating news. The decision of the Crown Prosecution Service, based upon their sufficiency criteria, was that there was not enough evidence upon which to base a prosecution. With the criticism of the police growing, they responded by following standard procedure for any unsolved murder and ordered an internal review of their handling of the case. It was called the Barker Report. Barker gave the investigation a clean bill of health. The Lawrences were outraged. But it wasn't long before a change in command at the Met would bring about a fresh start for the case. They decided they would be more vigorous, more innovative, and that led to the second investigation headed up by Bill Mellish. Mellish ordered surveillance equipment to be installed in Gary Dobson's flat in the hope of obtaining new evidence. They inserted a covert device, I think, into a plug. They were hoping that there would be admissions about the actual murder of Stephen. What they got was evidence of the, the virulent racism of those youths, of their 